I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm your host, Pastor Ray Sadakri. Thank you for tuning in today to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm so excited to be able to bring the Word of the Lord to you today. It's talking about the blood of Jesus. Did you know it speaks on our behalf? Well, I won't share any more. I don't want to take up the time because we can only bring you a one-part series of this uh, particular word. So you stay tuned and hear what the Spirit of God has to say to you today about the blood that redeems people from sin. Have your Bibles look there in Ephesians 3.14. I want to talk to you about the blood speaks on our behalf. Begin with verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, this is talking to you all, right, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, which, by the way, never uh, run out, to be strengthened with might, dunamis power, through his spirit in the inner man. You've got a, something greater than a nuclear core inside of you. You've got the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of all creation. And the creator God is inside of you. And you can do all things through him who gives you the strength. So Paul is praying that he would strengthen us with might in the inner man through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The more faith you have, the more Christ can dwell in your heart. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Now, get a hold of verse 19. This is where we're going. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses or passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, wait a minute. That we may know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. If you get past knowledge, what are you, how, are you going to, how are you going to know the love of God? You've got to experience it. It's not something that I've been taught in school. This is something I have experienced for myself. This is not a doctrine of a denomination. This is the Word of God. That you may be filled with the fullness of God. Doesn't the church need to be filled with the fullness of God? Yes. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. Now he goes beyond our limitations and picks up from where we are limited and goes ahead and does even more, right? He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the, here it comes again, the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for the power of this word today. We know you have a purpose. You have someone listening, both here in the audience and those that are watching by internet, that, that needs to hear this word, needs to experience your love, and let that love fill them with the fullness of God so that they know in whom they have believed that you're able. No matter what it is, you're able to do it. So have your way in this service today. In Jesus' name, somebody give him praise in the house. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now turn with me to John chapter 3. This is the foundation for the whole New Testament. John 3, 16. The blood speaks on our behalf. It says in John 3, 16, For God so loved, the word so is to the highest degree. Amen. Couldn't love us any greater. God so loved the world. Now I want you to look at the contrast. You've got God in all His holiness, all His uh, just ways, and He loves something as, as lost as the world. But He doesn't just love us. It says He so loved us. He so loved us that He acted on His love, and He did something. What did he do? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now I like this about as much as I like the last verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Thank God for that, right? He didn't come down here pointing a finger at us, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. Can I get a yeehaw there? He who believes in Jesus is not condemned. There is nothing more warm and more fuzzy than feeling condemnation. <laughs> See, in Jesus, if we just believe in him, we're not going to be condemned. 
We're not going to feel condemned. We're not going to walk in condemnation, are we? But he who does not believe, here it comes, is condemned already. He doesn't even have to condemn those that don't believe, does he? They're already condemned because, he has, uh, because that person has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the world uh, is walking in right now. Here's the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and the men and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Now, uh, I sensed in my spirit when the Holy Spirit was giving me this that our Heavenly Father wants to release to you today a greater dimension of His love to give us all a deeper understanding of just how much He truly loves us in the world. You know, you can talk about... I want you to go back a few decades when technology was not that advanced and running water inside the house seemed foreign to people. Now, we're going back a few years, aren't we? It was called outdoor facilities. You had to go outside and fetch your water. Anybody remember that? And, and, and you, you would go to a person that has been in that kind of environment, and you talk to them about airplanes, and you talk to them about uh, microwaves and how you can fix a meal in just a matter of, of seconds. And they look at you with this blank stare and say, Do what? You know, you're talking to someone who has not yet experienced that type of technology yet, and so they cannot make that connection with it. In the same way, Paul is talking to the church at Ephesus and these new believers in specifically, and he's telling them, guys, I know you've just gotten born again, but there is a love that God has for you that you don't even have a clue yet how much that love really is towards you. Now, we had to grow in our technology. We had to grow, you know, it's from faith to faith and glory to glory, from one level to another level, that we grow into these things. It doesn't just come overnight. I mean, the Wright brothers didn't get down on the drawing plan and say, you know what, I'm going to make up a, a, a 747 here. What do you think? Well, brother, I think you're on the right path. Go ahead and let me, I'll I tell you what I'll do. I'll up you one, I'll draw out a stealth fighter. That didn't come to them. I mean, it looked like toothpicks they were flying in. See, it started out gradually, but it, it came, and now look at, look at the technology. Look at the airplanes that we have now and the drones. I mean, the technology is, is boggling. Well, God wants us to experience His love in the same dimension or same understanding that I just explained to you how technology has advanced over the decades here, especially in America. God wants, He has another dimension of His love and His glory that He wants to reveal to us. And we can't just walk in it. It has to be delivered to us because faith comes by so, so there has to first come a greater dimension of understanding in His Word about His love before we can be recipients of that greater dimension or understanding of His love. Are you with me? And so once He starts opening up new things to you about who He is and what He has done for us, then you start saying, wow, I've never seen your love in that, that great of a capacity before. Well, that's what God is wanting to do today. After sin uh, entered the heart of man in the garden, God had every right to demand justice be served, but he forbear. He held off, did he not? He could have destroyed man right there. Said, that's it, you blew it, it's over, see ya. But instead, God chose to show us love instead of punishment. Can you say amen? Amen. He chose to show us love instead of punishment. When God came to Adam and he was naked and he was ashamed and he was afraid and he was hiding himself, God didn't pull him out and beat him with a belt. God went and killed an animal. The just, the innocent, for the guilty. An innocent 
animal was killed by God himself, he was the first one that shed blood on this earth. And he did that to cover the nakedness and the shame of man. God was... Sh God. Are you getting a hold of this? See, what Adam and Eve did deserved justice, punishment, and death. Because God already told him there in Genesis 2.15, he says, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. die. See, they, they, they were... Uh, they had already sealed their fate. They had already committed the sin. They had already committed the crime against God's law. They were already guilty in God's sight, and God could have destroyed them and been just in doing so, but he didn't. Instead, he went and found an innocent animal and killed it and took the skin off that animal and covered their nakedness. Now, when I look at that with the understanding that I have today, I look at God saying, I'm sorry for that animal, but I see the goodness of God in that. I don't see God being cruel to animals. I see God being loving toward man. I did not get what I deserved. I got grace. Oh boy, I got grace. Now I can go back and sin again. No. No. I got grace that gives me the ability to find a place to repent for the sin that I have committed. Now, instead of condemning us, which meant he could have, demen uh, uh, he could have deemed us reprehensible or evil after weighing the evidence of sin in our hearts, instead of God condemning us, God chose to send Jesus to suffer and die in our place. Please allow what I'm saying to get down into your heart and into your spirit and not just go through your head. God had every right to condemn us to eternal damnation, but instead he chose to place the punishment of our sins upon Jesus. Now you see the type and shadow there? God looks at Adam and Eve and their nakedness and then their shame and their sin, and he goes and kills an animal that is innocent. He looks at, the, at man's sin as a whole, and he says, I've got to have a sacrifice. I've got to have a lamb. And he looks to his right hand, and he says, My son, he's innocent. The Bible said, both in Isaiah and, and Peter, that there was no sin found in him, neither was there any guile or deceit found in his mouth. Yet God looked to him and says, I will offer you upon the sacrifice, as a sacrifice, as atonement for the sin of man. The guilty shall go free, and the just shall die. Wow. Yes. See, sin has consequences. But God did, even though he had every right to, to condemn us to eternal damnation, instead he chose to place the punishment for our sins upon his son Jesus. Not only did the Father, now this is good. What I've been saying is good, but get a hold of this. Not only did the Father not punish us, and condemn every one of us to eternal torment for our transgressions against he and his word. But when Jesus came to earth, he didn't condemn us either. Not only did we not get punished, but we're not even getting condemnation from Jesus. I don't see how anyone could ever demonstrate their love for someone any greater than the way that the Father and Jesus have chosen to demonstrate their love towards sinners. Right? I mean, God said, all right, that's it. I'm destroying you and earth and everything else in it. I'm going to destroy it, but he didn't. Jesus could have come and said, you're all sinners. You've all come short of God's glory, and I have come to rule and reign and to destroy you. But he didn't. Instead, God says, I am going to wait, and Jesus said, I have come to die. See, now that is the depth of God's love. See, now, now let's put this in context, okay? We're living in society now where love is getting very hard to find. Somebody can violate somebody's uh, rights or, or cross the line with them, and they go off on them like, like 40 going north. You hear every kind of colorful adjective coming out of their mouth against the person that has violated their rights or crossed the line with them, right? And, and you find it's very hard for people to forgive other people for the wrongs that have been done against them. 
Are we not seeing this? People are really struggling right now trying to find forgiveness to forgive others. But God demonstrated his love in this, that while we were yet still sinners and still in our, our sinful ways, God loved us and gave his son to die for us. Now that is love. Now when you contrast our pitiful love against God's great love, it shows you just how much he has loved us. That he would let us continue in our ways until we come to a place of repentance. Now, why would a just God, who knows our thoughts from afar off, before they even get to our head, he already knows what we're going to think, why would a just God allow an unjust people who had broken his laws to go free without reprisal and punishment and then punish his son in our place? The answer is love and mercy. Does this mean that God allows us to continue in our sins that his mercy might continue to cover our future sins? When someone isn't punished for the error of their ways, isn't there a chance that they will repeat their offenses? Yes, absolutely. Even, even our own penal system shows us that there are people who go through the, the penal system, go through the correction system, and they come out and they're repeat offenders after paying for their crime. Now, could you imagine if America never had a correction system, never had a, a, a penalty system where you, you paid for the error of your ways or your sin or crimes against humanity? Can you imagine how lawless and how awful America would be right now? It would be horrible. But yet God says, I am going to let you go free, and I'm going to take your penalty and place it upon my son who is innocent. Now, isn't there a chance that God would, would uh, by doing this, would say, all right, go ahead, you're free to sin. Wouldn't it look like God would want to scare hell out of them? No. Romans 2. God is long-suffering, forbearing, wanting people to, to see the goodness of God that it will produce in them repentance. So God's grace is not that the, the past or the permission slip from God to continue in your sin. The goodness of God is, I haven't destroyed you yet, so you could come to your, your, your senses and repent of your sin before it's too late. Right? So when God says, I'm not punishing you right now, it's not that God's letting you get away with it. It's that God's giving you time to repent. Now look at 2 Peter 3.8. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Now, for those who have not heard me teach this, remember Adam, uh, Jesus, God said, in the day that you eat of it, you surely die. Adam died when he was 930 years old. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. In the day that he ate, he died. But it took 930 years for him to die. God gave him space to repent. You, you getting the picture now? Beloved, do not forget. He Keep it in context because this is where Peter is going. Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is, is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering. He was long-suffering with Adam, was he not? Gave him 930 years to get things right? Yes. He's long-suffering with us. Why? He's not willing that any should perish, but he gives us this long period to get things right that we should come to repentance and not perish. But know this, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's going to come. Judgment day is going to come. Reckoning day is going to come. But if you don't get things right now, then it's over. Through love and mercy, God has put off our punishment that we might have time to do as the prodigal son did, come to our senses and to know his love and to repent of our sin before it is too late. He's given us time, isn't he, guys? He's given America time, is he not? Yes. God has given every person a period of grace in which to turn away from our sinful ways and to find forgiveness and be restored. 
but far too many view God's grace as a permission slip or a pass to continue in their sinful lifestyle. Instead of seeing the long-suffering of God as goodness that leads them to repentance, they're taking advantage of His love and abusing it and His mercy to live yet another day in their sin. Am I preaching right yet? God's given them breath to breathe. They're, he's given them another day of life to live and to repent. And they say, wow, God gave me another day. I can go out and have my fun. They ignore the goodness of God. They feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit on the heart, but they're not submitting to it. Wow. God help us get this. Because... When you say long-suffering, the enemy says, go ahead. You got another day. Enjoy it. Live life to the fullest. Get all the gusto you can get while you got it. And Satan uses that lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life to rob people so that they don't believe the gospel and repent and are saved. And they die having all that time to repent, and they miss their opportunity. And they will stand before God with their hand, fist shaking at him, saying, God, why didn't you save me? And God will give them a playback. See this? When you were eight, I dealt with your heart. When you were 12 and you got hurt, I dealt with your heart. And when you were 18 and you said, I'm going to go into drugs and alcohol and live all, I want, all the life I want to live, I dealt with your heart. When you were 22, when you were 25, when you were 33, when you were 40, when you were 50, when you were 60, and when you were on your deathbed at 80, I still dealt with your heart, and you still hardened your heart to me. You will not have an excuse when you stand before God because God has, he has bent over backwards to save us. Now, so he has put off our punishment that we might have time to come to our senses like the prodigal son so that uh, our sin can be dealt with before it's too late. God has given us, everyone, a period of grace to turn from our sinful ways and to find forgiveness and be restored. So to further demonstrate the love that our Heavenly Father has shown us, the Holy Spirit has opened up some truths to me, and I want to share to you these truths about the blood of Jesus, and then you can go on home. Turn with me to Exodus 12. The Old Testament is filled with typology and prophecies of the coming Messiah. And we see these things portrayed in various stories from the Old Testament. The one I'm about to read you is one of uh, the, the type, typology or the shadow of Jesus being the Lamb of God that shed his blood so that we could be delivered from our sin in the land of bondage or the world. Now look there in verse 1, Exodus 12. Are you there? Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, the land of bondage, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. Isn't that amazing? God's starting a new history with the children of Israel. And, and God is, though we're aging, the Bible says, uh, though we're growing old, my paraphrase, our inward man is being renewed day by day. So inside, I'm getting newer and newer. Outside, I'm getting older and older. But don't look at the outside. See, we're getting new again. God gives, matter of fact, Paul writes to the church at Corinth there in 2 Corinthians. He says, uh, when you're in Christ, you, you have a new beginning, Right? Behold, all things become new, and the old things are passed away. So God gives us a new beginning. So he's saying here in Exodus 12, he says, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Why? Something new is fixing to happen in their lives, right? Their old life of bondage is going to be done away with, and their new life of liberty and freedom under God is going to begin. So it's going to be a new history for you guys. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Say a lamb. Yeah. According to the house of his father, <clears throat> a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make uh, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take uh, some of the blood. Some of the what? Blood. The blood. And put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Now uh, drop down to verse 12. And this is why he's telling them to take the blood of the innocent lambs that they slaughter and uh, put the blood on the doorpost of the lintel of the, the door of their house, the entrance into their house. Uh, Jesus said in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears me and opens up, I and the Father will come in and we will sup. So this is the blood applying to the door of the heart. Amen? This is type and a shadow of that. So here's the reason why God is telling them to apply that blood to the doorpost and the lentils. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both male and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute what? Judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. Look at it. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. What is he talking about there? As long as the Jews did what Moses God commanded Moses to do, and they applied the, door, the blood to the doorposts and lentils of their houses, then that means they were protected from the plague of death that was going to strike all the firstborn males. Right? They had to do what God said if they wanted to be protected from the plague of death. Correct? So they did that. Now, here is, for those who have not heard this teaching yet, when, when people preach this, they don't break that word down, what they just read, and they say God's going in there and striking them dead. But what he said there, he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That goes to Psalm 91. He says, he that abideth under the shadow of the Most High, uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of, of, of God. So here it is. God says, when I go across there and I see blood upon that, I will pass over you. So he's there passing. That word passing means I will hover over you. And when I hover over you, the, the, the plague of death is going to come, but it won't see you. It will see me and it will pass over you. Well, I know the Word of God has greatly impacted your life today. I know it sure did touch the congregation here at War Harvest Church North. You know, learning about the blood of Jesus and how it speaks on our behalf, it, it allows us to know the power that we have through that matchless name called Jesus. I invite you to get a copy of this uh, program in its entirety. You can order it online at whcnorth.org or you can call the church office. All the details will be there on the bottom of the screen. But before I leave you today, I want to encourage you, if you have any prayer needs or requests, or if you'd like to contact us and let us know how this program is ministering to you and to your family, we sure would love to hear from you. That contact information will be on the bottom of the screen as well. And before I leave you today, I want to pray God's blessings upon you and upon your family. And Lord, I just ask that you will encourage, you will touch, you will deliver and heal your people as they hear this word go forth. It will build faith in their hearts to receive that that need, that desire, that request in their life today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you until this time next week. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. Visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. 